The Care of Patients with Musculoskeletal and Connective Tissue Disorders, Chapter 32. The most common sprain injuries occur either in the ankle, the knee, or the wrist. Depending on the severity of the sprain, there will be different signs and symptoms noted. They can be either grade one, which is mild, grade two, that is moderate, or grade three, that is severe and has a complete tear. RICE is a common acronym used for the treatment of sprains. Ice should be applied immediately after injury and for 24 to 72 hours. For every 10 minutes, one to two hours during the day. It should be wrapped with an elastic bandage so it doesn't cut off the circulation and should be elevated to decrease the amount of swelling. The goal is to protect the injury and the ligament. Ligaments do not grow back together. Air casts, brace, or supports are used until the joint has been strengthened. If a joint is immobilized for too long of a period and muscles are not exercised, the muscles will begin to atrophy, and that can be in a mere matter of days. This can cause permanent disability. For nursing staff, the most commonly strained muscles are the muscles of the lower back. Heat may be applied after 48 hours. Anti-inflammatory medications may be used for discomfort. When there is a spasm present, a muscle may relax it may be prescribed by the physician. A dislocation is the stretching and tearing of ligaments around a joint with complete displacement of the bone. Subluxation is a partial dislocation. The most common sites for injury of dislocation or subluxation are the shoulder, knee, ankle, and the temporomandibular joint. The treatment goal is to stabilize the joint after reduction and then to rehabilitate to minimize the muscular atrophy while strengthening the joint. Bursitis is most commonly seen in the elbow, the shoulder, the hip, or the knee. As nurses, we want to make sure that we do an assessment on the area. Note the pain and ask if the patient needs any mobilization devices. We want to also make sure that we note if there's any limitations. Are they able to do their own range of motion? A rotator cuff injury usually results from a repetitive activity like throwing a ball and it can result in a degenerative tear. Falls and traumas can also cause acute injury. The rotator cuff is composed of four muscles. The anterior cruciate ligament or the ACL injury of the knee occurs during athletic activities, falls, or motor vehicle accidents. Hyperextension, internal rotation, extremes of external rotation, and deceleration are often involved. The meniscus is the shock absorber of the knee and it lies on top of the tibia between the tibia and the femur. A meniscus tear may accompany an ACL injury. This type of injury often results from a fixed foot rotation in weight bearing with the knee flexed, like in football, soccer, basketball, or skiing. The Achilles tendon attaches the solus, plantaris, and gastrocnemius muscles to the calcaneus. When overstretched, it may rupture. Sports injuries or a fall from a height are the usual mechanisms of injury. <laughs> a bunion is the most common foot problem and it's a painful swelling of the bursa that occurs when the great toe deviates laterally at the metatarsophalangeal joint. It can be hereditary or it can be from ill-fitting shoes. 
Bunions are often more common in women than they are in men. Carpal tunnel syndrome is due to the repetitive movements of the hands and wrists. Especially with the constant flexion of the wrist, these are contributing causes to the carpal tunnel syndrome. Surgical decompression of the medial nerve by transection of the carpal ligament is performed, usually as an outpatient. Postoperatively, blood flow must be assessed hourly by checking the warmth, the color of the fingertips, and the capillary refill. After anesthesia has worn off, the fingers need to be assessed. The wrist is immobilized in a splint and the arm should be elevated on pillows to reduce the amount of edema. The patient is warned to avoid any heavy gripping or pinching for up to six weeks. The mechanism of injury or how the injury occurred may provide clues about the type of fracture that is seen. Fractures are quite painful for individuals because bones can be displaced and broken in two. They need Im immediate immobilization. A complete fracture is when a bone breaks into two parts that are completely separated. An incomplete fracture is when the bone breaks into two parts that are not completely separated. A comminuted fracture is one where the bone is broken and shattered into more than two fragments. A closed, considered simple fracture is where there is no break in the skin. An open or a compound fracture is a fracture where there is a break in the skin in which fragments of bones protrude. A green stick fracture that is common in children is one where the bone is partially bent and broken. There are five stages of bone healing. The blood oozes from the torn blood vessels in the area of the fracture and clots, then begins to form a hematoma between the two broken ends of the bone. This can take one to three days. Other tissue cells will enter the clot and granulation tissue is formed. This tissue is interlaced with capillaries and it gradually becomes firm and forms a bridge between the two ends of the broken bones. This will usually take three days to two weeks. The young bone cells enter the area and form a tissue called a callus. At this stage, the ends of the broken bone are beginning to knit together. This can take two to six weeks. The immature bone cells are gradually replaced by mature bone cells, and this is known as ossification. The tissue then takes on the characteristic of the typical bone structure. This can be from three weeks to six months. Bone is reabsorbed and deposited depending on the lines of stress. The medullary canal is reconstructed, reconstructed during consolidation and remodeling. And this is from six weeks to one year after initial injury. The surgeon brings the two broken ends of bone together in proper alignment and then immobilizes the affected part until healing is complete. A closed reduction is when the bone is manipulated into alignment and there's no incision made. A general anesthesia will be given before the fracture is reduced. An open reduction is done after a surgical incision is made through the skin and down to the bone at the site of the fracture. In cases of open or compound fractures and commuted fractures, an open reduction is necessary so that the area can be adequately cleansed and bone fragments, fragments removed. The physician stabilizes the bone with pins, screws, nails, or metal and metal plates. It is necessary to treat fractures in older individuals whose bones are brittle and may not heal appropriately. For <clears throat> an incision is made, the fracture is then realigned and the bone is secured with hardware or pins, nails, plates. A drain will often be put in place until there is a scant amount of drainage, which is less than 30 milliliters per 24 hours. 
If a prosthesis is implanted, there will be more blood loss and the patient may receive an auto transfusion of salvaged blood products after surgery. Administration of IV antibiotics is done to reduce the risk of infection. The care for the patient includes maintaining good alignment of the affected area, preventing complications of immobility, and keeping the patient as comfortable as possible with pain control. External fixation of fractures involves the use of a device that is composed of steady, sturdy external frame to which there are attached pins that have been placed into the bone fragments. Casts are often used for stabilizing a fracture after a closed reduction. A, a cast is rigid and immobilizes the injured body part. Fiberglass and polyester cotton knit casts are lightweight, they dry quickly, and they can bear weight within 30 minutes of the cast application. Braces will provide a support for fractures that have been reduced. The advantage of a brace is that it can be easily removed for assessment as well as care of the skin, and then the brace may be reapplied. Traction is the use of a mechanical pull to a part of the body for the purpose of extending and holding that part in a certain position during immobilization. Current applications of traction are reflected in a small study of severely injured patients in which the advantages of skeletal traction over external fixation were identified. Skeletal traction is more simple and takes minutes to apply, it is inexpensive and it doesn't involve any anesthesia. For skin traction, a bandage or a foam traction boot is applied to the limb below the site of the fracture and a pull is exerted on the limb. No more than seven to 10 pounds of weight will be used for skin traction. The continued twisting, shearing and abnormal stress prohibits a strong and bony union of two bones. Inadequate levels of serum calcium and phosphorus, vitamin deficiency, and generalized atherosclerosis, which deprives the healing site of adequate blood supply, can complicate a fracture by delay delaying healing. For any open fracture, the patient will be given antibiotics to help reduce the chances of infection. Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. It is often considered a staph infection. If the infection is severe enough, amputation may be the only cure. The non-union of a fracture or the failure of it to heal can be treated non-surgically by an electrical bone growth stimulating device that uses electrical um, electrodes to reduce, to induce weak electrical current in the bone to stimulate osteogenesis or growth of the bone cells. The use of these devices can prevent further surgery and bone grafting. This treatment is based on the fact the bone has an inherent electrical property that is used in healing. To form an embolism, the fat globules must be large enough or sufficient in number to partially or completely obstruct a blood vessel. The number one safety occurrence for a fat embolism is to make sure the patient's head is raised into a high Fowler's position. This will help hopefully decrease the clot from traveling upward in the body. To meet national patient safety goals, nurses need to be vigilant for the adverse effects of prophylactic anticoagulant medications like aspirin, warfarin, or low molecular weight heparin that may be ordered. Atrixa, a new class of antithrombo drug inhibiting factor XA, is a clotting component that may be administered along with warfarin sodium. 
Compartment syndrome is caused by external or internal pressure and seriously restricts circulation to that area. External pressure can occur from dressings or casts that are too tight. Internal pressure occurs from excessive IV fluid infusion, inflammation, and edema. The increased fluid puts pressure on the tissues, nerves, and blood vessels, thereby decreasing the blood flow. If a cast is in place, the cast will need to be bivalved to allow the pressure to not be constricted on the extremity. Diagnosis for Lyme disease is based on clinical presentation and the possibility of being exposed to infected ticks. In early stages, lab testing is not reliable and is not recommended. If Lyme disease is undiagnosed or untreated, stage two begins two to four weeks after the infection and you will notice carditis, nervous system disorders like meningitis, peripheral neuritis, or fascial paralysis, similar to Bell's palsy. IV antibiotics are necessary. If it still goes undiagnosed and untreated, later complications may occur. The patient may experience fatigue, cognition problems, and arthralgias. In some instances, the only sign of Lyme disease is arthritis. Lyme arthritis may cause permanent damage to the nervous system and to the joints. The word arthritis, when literally translated, means inflammation of a joint. Osteoarthritis is a non-inflammatory degenerative joint disease that may affect any weight-bearing joint. The exact cause is unknown. Risk factors are heredity, aging, female gender, obesity, previous joint injury, and recreational or occupational usage. People with osteoarthritis seem to produce less collagen to strengthen cartilage and cover as well as protect joints in the body. With time and use, joints become thickened and withstand weight bearing poorly with consequent damage to the cartilage. The synovial cells then release enzymes that further cause cartilage degeneration. Acetaminophen in doses of 1,000 milligrams up to 3,000 milligrams per day is the standard for patients with mild to moderate chronic joint pain. Weight reduction will help to decrease the amount of stress on weight-bearing joints. Maintaining mobility and controlling pain with the least amount of side effects are goals for the older adult that has rheumatoid arthritis. The diagnosis is by the history of a morning stiffness that lasts for more than one hour or arthritis pain in three or more joints that lasts more than six weeks. Various types of arthritis are depicted here. In A, it shows osteoarthritis. Note the presence of the nodes in the proximal interphalangeal joints, which are Bouchard nodes, as well as the distal interphalangeal joints, which are Heberns, Heberden nodes. B is rheumatoid arthritis. Note the marked ulnar or elbow-like deviation of the wrists. C is gouty arthritis. Note the tophi or the stones that contain the sodium urate crystals. Systemic corticosteroids have a profound anti-inflammatory effect on arthritis and were once thought to be miracle drugs to, tr to treat arthritis. However, the anti-inflammatory action tends to diminish over time and it requires higher doses to obtain the same results. Long-term steroid therapy increases an individual's risk for diabetes mellitus, osteoporosis, hypertension, 
acne, cataracts, and weight gain. This makes long-term steroid preparations reserved only for patients who cannot find relief from other medications. For arthritis, intra-articular administration of the steroids is what is used. Casts, braces, and sometimes splints are used to immobilize an affected part so that it can rest during an active phase of the arthritic disease. Devices that immobilize the affected joint should allow for motion of adjacent muscles to provide improving muscle strength and to permit more independence on the part of the patient. Braces also can work to prevent deformities by maintaining optimal function positioning of the joint. A synovectomy is the excision of a synovial membrane of a joint. The goal of the synovectomy is to interrupt the destructive inflammatory process that eventually leads to alkalos alkalosis and the invasion of the surrounding cart cartilage and bony tissues. For younger patients with osteoarthritis, osteotomy might be an option. In this procedure, a wedge of bone is removed to allow for realignment. Tendon reconstruction is performed most frequently on the hand to restore functioning. Our therapeutic goal for these individuals are to help control pain and to pro help provide them with mobility. Patients that have any hip replacements need to make sure that they are mobile multiple times a day. The deposit of urate crystals occurs in joints and subcutaneous tissues and urate crystals can cause kidney stones. The big toe is the most common site for gout, but other joints may be affected. As a nurse, we know that we need to help our patient manage their gout. So they are not able to eat high purine foods and they need to increase their liquids. Osteoporosis is when the bone be starts to become porous due to decreased calcium and vitamin D3. Also, age and heredity play parts in osteoporosis. It is more frequent in women. When diagnosing, looking at radiographs, the bone of the patient with osteoporosis will appear more porous. The DXA is used to <clears throat> assess the amount of bone density or the loss of bone. It is reported as a T-score. Normal bone density, a T-score is greater than one standard deviation from a healthy adult. For osteoporosis, the T-score is 2.5 to 3.0 standard deviations below a healthy young adult. Dietary or supplemental calcium and vitamin D3, combining with weight-bearing exercise, are the standard treatments for osteoporosis. Calcium supplements, if necessary, should be taken in doses, divided doses, during the day. Exposure to sufficient sunlight or vitamin D3 supplements are necessary for the proper absorption and metabolism of calcium. The current guidelines recommend 800 to 4,000 units of vitamin D3 per day. Vertebral compression fractures commonly occur in patients that have osteoporosis. These are often treated with pain medication, activity limitation, physical therapy, and bracing. Two new minimally invasive spine procedures are viable treatments for those who do not respond to the conservative therapies. A vertebroplasty involves the percutaneous injection of cement directly into the osteoporotic spinal area under fluoroscopy. This can stabilize the bone and help reduce or eliminate pain. 
A kyphoplasty consists of the percutaneous insertion of an inflatable device into the vertebral fractured body under fluoroscopy. The inflated device alleviates the end plates and restores the vertebral body toward its original height. Paget's disease is a problem of abnormal bone reabsorption that is followed by replacement of normal marrow with fibrous connective tissue. The abnormal bone is weak and it is prone to fractures. Bone is subjective to both benign and malignant tumors. Tumors can arise from several different types of tissue, including chondromas, which is cartilage, bone, which is osteomas, and fibro fibrous tissue, which is fibromas. Benign tumors are often found on radiography or at the time of the fracture. Malignant bone tumors are either primary or secondary to, the, to a metastatic disease process. Diagnosing and treating cancer in other parts of the body early can prevent the occurrence of metastasis to the bone. Primary malignant bone tumors are most common in individuals aged 10 to 25 years of age. The most common type of malignant bone tumor is osteosarcoma or osteogenic sarcoma. Almost 80% of all limb amputations involve the lower extremity. This expresses how to care for an individual after an accidental amputation by how, by how to clean the injury as well as how to keep the part viable. Postoperative care for an amputation is imperative because the nurse needs to monitor for edema and hemorrhage following the amputation. You need to make sure that they um, are very adherent to elevating the limb for 24 hours. There are different forms of prosthesis that individuals may wear. This lady that is dancing has a sea leg prosthesis. The patient needs to be taught about care of their stump and how to return to their activities of daily living. The nurse will assist the patient through education and assisting with rehabilitation.